So next we're moving on to painting, uh, the second popular two-dimensional art form. And I forgot to mention um, previously, but but, but two-dimensional art usually it, it means that it exists in two dimensions, right? That it only has uh, the the height and the width, right? It doesn't have uh, the the volume, right? That a, you know, two a three-dimensional artwork has. And so because of that, we usually see the the the, the support, right, of of the actual drawing or the or the painting is something that's flat right so a piece of paper uh, a piece of canvas uh, a, a, a wood surface example and so the focus is a lot on vision right because that's the really the main thing that we as spectators can use to enter the whatever is being depicted we can't necessarily walk around it or the the intention is not for us to walk around i mean you can always at a museum or when you see a painting you can always look um around and see you know the edges and i always like to do that just because i i'm, I'm curious about how artists treat their edges and uh, and what and how and what that does to my perception of what's happening but the focus is mainly front frontal looking at whatever is being depicted. And so drawing and painting share a similarity in that they use their tools to create certain illusions of space because there is an actual three-dimensional space. Um, but if you if that is your intention as an artist to get, give that illusion, then you have to use your materials in a certain way that tricks the eye. And, and there's a lot of techniques um, for that. Um, <clears throat> but so, when we're, so moving on to painting, very similar to drawing that we have different media, we have different materials, we have different tools that can create different effects for for us, the viewer. And so we're going to go walk through just a few of the the, the most f famous, um, the most used types of painting. I'll give you definitions of what each one of these these terms mean, and give you an example and sh and see and, and have you see really what what how it changes what what we're looking at. And so painting is very old. <laughs> And uh, another great example of how drawing and painting really are very blurred, especially when you're thinking about those wet materials of, of drawing, such as ink. And, and so the first paintings, right, when humans decided right that we have we wanted to create images we wanted to pick make use pigments and use our hands and really just represent the world around us that happened so very long ago and this is a cave painting uh just a a segment um for uh from um indonesia that shows this wonderful warthog right you see his little warthog face uh and you know see his little legs um as well as these wonderful stencils of actual really early human hands and um and this is from 45,000 BCE so it's before the current era so it's very long ago almost unimaginably lo long ago and so this early you know prehistoric human in Indonesia went into caves and we find cave paintings from you know the, the stone age all over the world you know, Argentina Europe Africa Indonesia um, went and, and used used ochre, which is a type is a pigment that has this wonderful red color. It's it's very vividly red, and suspended it in in some sort of medi medium water, uh, other types of, of viscous liquid, um, because ochre is a powder. So you would grind it up and then use it, and then and then you would apply it with your fingers with a reed, right? And in the case of the stencil, which I think is really cool, is that actually putting your hand on the stone and blowing right with your mouth like almost like a your your mouth is a, a spray can over your hand and then you, when you lift your hand off you have this wonderful impression this imprint of yourself 
And so painting has happened for a very, very long time. So it's very, very important to just humans all over, <laughs> all over the globe. Um, and no wonder it continues to be a extremely popular medium for self-expression. I mean, for a lot of different reasons. And so, uh, like I said, painting typically means, and that's what, that's what makes it kind of unlike drawing, because if you notice, drawing is very much about the uh, applying that material itself, right, to a surface. So it's graphite, right? It's um, the ink, right? It's the charcoal that you're making um, your 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 lines, your shading. But with painting, it's, it starts out it starts out with a organic um, matter, right? But you but it, it you want the pigment, you want the color, right? So painting is very much about color and, co and conveying that. And so you need to mix these different uh, material these materials, usually stones, um, and different types of substances. Sometimes the beetle, so beetle, um, the, there's a particular beetle uh, uh, that the crushing up of its wings creates this wonderful reddish color called carmine. That's actually one of my favorite colors, um, uh, specifically reds, but you have to mix it in some sort of viscous sub substance that then can be applied to a surface, typically with a brush. That is one of the very famous and popular um, tools um, but you can paint with all sorts of different things i mean if we you know thinking about modern art famously jackson pollock if you if you if that uh, name means anything to you he would actually apply <laughs> apply paint from with the back of with the back of brushes and with different tools and he would just splatter um the paint on um, a surface so you can paint with all sorts of things but the main thing the main takeaway is that it's a pigment that has to be mixed with a viscous substance and we can change what that viscous substance is and and with that comes a change in the look and uh, how you can create this illusionistic space if that is what you want to do and so the first one is encaustic and this has also very ancient roots it was very pop it was a very popular method of painting if you see in this left for um the egyptian culture specifically in the era of, of of when it was part of imperial rome right so for if you remember if you think about cleopatra and mark antony right this is that that is the, the 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 egypt right and so using encaustic as painting especially for these portraits on wood that these would actually be put on sarcophagus so this is this has a funeral intention and so you would have the the mummified body Body and and then in the sarcophagus and then you would have this wonderful portrait of the person inside and that is something that very much this these kind of Greek and Roman influence on Egyptian culture you know added that that to that twist right and so encaustic is pigment so different colors different materials ground up mixed with beeswax right and if you've ever uh handled beeswax before uh, you sh you know that it when it's cold right it, it's very hard um, but you can still m you know make it malleable but it, you you can all you can heat it up right and it becomes viscous and so so that is very important to the process and the application in in, in the look right it has this kind of it has that waxy look and you, you can totally see it in this portrait of a young boy um that the, the shine right it has this kind of yeah this kind of if, if anyone's seen kind of a wax uh, a wax doll or you know a wax um you know madame trousseau's wax uh, museum right it has this this the sheen and but you can also get it very very detailed you can mix and you can shade and you can blend and most importantly you can overlap right your 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 pigment because you can let your base layer you can apply it you can let it dry a little bit or or not but then you can add another layer and kind of mix it mix it in and so it has this 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 yeah this layered layer effect which i think you can actually see a little bit more with with mary black's very contemporary use of encaustic 
paint, right? And, and she's very much interested in thinking about that the aspect of encaustic that you can layer it very easily, and it's not it's not going to bleed and blend um, all together. It, it can if if you do that that way, but it but she's really interested in that waxiness and that build up of color and pigment um, and in, in a very expressive way. And so this is encaustic and it's a very durable medium. It's, as you can imagine, beeswax is pretty, pretty durable. And that is why we have so many of these um, wonderful funerary portraits from this period in, 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 in ancient Egypt because of the, the dry environment, right? Um, we have, uh, it, it really preserved well, and especially the, 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 the vi how vivid these colors are preserved well um, in, 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 in the environment. So now we're going to move on to fresco. And I mentioned that, the, I gave a teaser at the beginning of the R2D episode that um, you know, we would be talking about fresco. And fresco is an, an interesting one. It, 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 it has also been around since the ancient times, um, but, it has a, but it really had a, a resurgence in the, in, the, in the early Renaissance and through the Renaissance with, with painters. And fresco is, the, our, our viscous material is water, right? And, um, and, and you mix your pigment with water, but it has a very specific process. Um, it's very in, involved. So what you need to do, if you imagine, I'm going to create a vision for us. Fresco is very popular with as as murals. So, it, you know, creating a painting on a wall, right? As we see with Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, a very famous, um, a very famous fresco, which is in a um, is in the Santa della Grazia in Milan, and we have um, this wonderful illusionistic fresco um, by and Andrea Mantagna um, in, in also in a, it's a, in a palace, right? And I'll talk a little bit about um, this, this, this interesting use of illusion um, in, in a little bit. But if you notice, these are murals. These are meant to be on walls, on actual structures. So how do you apply this, this, this technique? Well, you need to start with wet plaster. So artists need to actually apply wet a wet layer of, of plaster on the actual wall, whatever it is, it could be stone, it could be wood or whatever. And they apply that. And while it's that, that plaster is still wet, and this is important, so remember, they, they need to apply their, their, their pigment and water to that wet surface. And that's because you know, when that base layer of plaster starts to dry, it's going to suck in that wet plaster. So what you're trying to do is you're melding your pigment to the actual wall and you, and you need both of those to be wet. The plaster, the, the base layer of plaster, which is just like white or some base color, and then you add your pigment. And then um, it kind of calcifies as both of them dry, the, the surface calcifies. And so this becomes a very durable type of, of painting. And as you can see um, here um, in Mantegna's, this this vibrant the vibrancy of the color doesn't doesn't go away um, and so in a lot of places frescoes and churches there is build up right because it is a surface on a wall there's build up of smoke and you know different types of of, of you know substances from the air especially you know, if you're thinking about like a, a Catholic church there's a lot of candles and and whatnot and incense. But and so you know, conservators actually have to go and, and they and they clean the surface. But underneath these frescoes, it's still vibrant. Right? It doesn't act. So it's very durable. And because they, it's usually used in um, in buildings, you can create act architectural elements that don't ex actually exist, right? So in this ducal palace in Mantua, uh, he's he's created an oculus in, in a ceiling. So the the actual palace didn't have an oculus, which is just a you know a hole, right, in in the ceiling that leads to the outside. Um, but he's creating the sense and the illusion and tricking us into thinking about that, and then he's. Really Really messing with our perspective and thinking that there are angels and Puti and different characters kind of on the roof looking in and that we see this bright sky. And so you can do a lot of really cool, interesting things with fresco, especially in um, within building spaces. 
But before we move on, I want to just comment a little bit on, on The Last Supper. Uh, this is a really great example of um, an artist who's really trying to mess with that, that base technique, wet plaster, wet pigment in water. And of course, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was always trying to reinvent and, and experiment with different things. And so he actually um, mixed in um, a, a, a resin, so an, oily substances to his water and pigment. And so if you're thinking, well, oil, water, they don't really mix. And so his fresco is not very durable and causes con conservators a lot of a lot of headache because things are flaking off, the pigments getting dull. And as you can see, it, it's it, 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 you know, it, it gets very muddy, right? It's not as vibrant as, as it used to be. So that's fresco. Then we have tempera, right? So tempera is um, a, the pigment, right, mixed with egg yolk. <laughs> and, and, and what this causes is a transparent soft glow. So tempera paintings have this, yeah, this wonderful, delicate translucidness. And this is Chris, uh, famous, uh, a famous painting by Andrew Wyeth, American painter, Christina's World. And you know you can you, and I, and I love showing this as an example of of tempera because the way that he has made this grassland, the grassiness and the different shadows and lights and darks that you get with when you look at, at fields, right? And that that the the tempera really allows for that softness, that glow that you see when you see hay. Um, a stack of hay has so much detail and it has so much vibrancy. And um, yeah, and, and Wyeth is really using it to maximize the impact for us of this, this landscape, which, you know, is not, it's not bland. You know, you would think, you know, oh, a monotone color uh, of, of, of this grassland is going to be boring and lack visual interest, lack, lack a sense of material that you can actually feel the blades grass. You can see, you can feel Christina, you know, in, in, you know, in this position. And, and and a lot of that has to do with the tempera mixed with egg yolk causing a transparent soft glow. And, and tempera is also another very stable and durable painting method because if any of you has left a bowl out after making scrambled eggs and, 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 and let it dry, that, that egg yolk is, it will, is it just permanently on, on your bowl or plate. It takes a long time to get, to get dried egg yolk off of things. And the same thing with the painting. And then we have oil. Oil, you've probably all heard of oil painting, and the viscous material is oil, often linseed oil. So, uh, you know, uh, historically an or organic source, uh, source, but then, you know, also synthetic oils, you know, have been used for you know, commercial oil paints that you can buy. And um, this has been very popular. It was popularized in in Europe, in, uh, in particular during the Renaissance. And with oil, because you can really, really blend really, really well. And it's a tricky painting method because it takes a long time for oil painting to dry, and you really have to think about your layers, right? So, you know, what is what is your base color? How are you going to apply lights and darks in what order? Because these pigments are going to blend if you mess with it a little bit too much. And I like uh, Francis Bacon's figure with meat, right? And he's known to have these very macabre subject matter is very dark, right? And so he, you can see he's using that intensity, right? Because oil paint it can get very intense colors um, and they'll stay intense. So he's using the intensity of the dark, the blacks, the this deep purple, and really using the layering and the brush strokes, right? To really show his, his, the movement of his brush to create this very disorienting and kind of dark and sinister, grotesque environment. Um, and, and, and this is one way of using oil to create a sensation and, and you know, creating a particular meaning. But, um, you know, oil paint can also be used to make really, really, really detailed um, portraits and paintings uh, of different things because it can blend really well. You, you, can, you can actually mask the hand of 
the actual painter, right? So Francis Bacon really wants to show the hand of the artist and the brush strokes, but some oil painters, they can actually totally erase that and you can't see it at all. And lastly, we're going to talk about watercolor and gouache, uh, a very popular type of painting. I am not very good at watercolor. Uh, I, I, I don't know if any of you probably, some of you have probably dabbled in watercolor, but we're going to talk about watercolor and gouache and think about how they're similar and think about how they're a little bit different. And so watercolor is pigment mixed with water, very much like the fresco, but you're not applying it to a wall. You're applying it usually to paper. Right, because it's it's because it because you're you're really using the water as um, and the pigment and the different concentrations, right? And so I think this is why it's always so hard for me to get how to how to how to do watercolor because I haven't controlled that that you know the, the more paint and then adding water to make it looser and uh, you can really see that in the clouds how Thomas Girton really concentrated the blues but then used more water um, to really make this this airy fluid environment and so watercolor has a um a looseness to it um and and i and uh, the people people who love watercolor love that looseness because you can really play with different shapes and different colors and how they interact with each other and then, but then there's there's gouache, which is watercolor, but it's mixed, so it's pigment and water, but you, you add a sticky binder, in particular gum arabic, which is an ingredient in a lot of, I think, different different types of candies, I think, it's a, it's a common one, um, and that's gouache. And so with that, you, 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 you can make it stickier, you can make, um, harder lines, so it's so you have that looseness of the of the watercolor itself, but you know you can go back with gouache and you can um, really you know create like the detail on say a castle which we see here or the shoreline or these people who are having a wonderful nice little it looks like a little bonfire uh, or <laughs> by by the sh by this moody moody um, this moody uh, English uh, shore. So that's the difference with uh, watercolor and gouache. So that's it for this episode, and I will see you back for the next.